Hello and welcome to the Political History of the United States, Episode 3.8, The Pennsylvania Charter of Privileges. Last week, we spent our time looking at the turbulent years in Pennsylvania during the Glorious Revolution. While the colony itself was spared many of the hardships of its neighbors, their leader William Penn fared far less well. After years of waiting, William Penn had been cleared of those treason charges against him, which stemmed out of his relationship with James II. While he must have been pleased about the acquittal, William Penn was still facing some very serious challenges. Across the Atlantic, his colony was nearing the breaking point. Both in London and back in Pennsylvania, he found that his reputation had taken a huge hit throughout this entire ordeal and that he was now largely just ignored. Finally, on top of all of this, he was struggling with very serious financial problems and found himself fighting just to keep his head above water. Penn, of course, was not an innocent victim in all of this. His bizarre appointments, combined with an increasingly fractured populace in Pennsylvania, did him very few favors. This week, I want to spend our time looking at a handful of different things. I want to continue to explore some of that internal dissension inside of Pennsylvania, and ultimately roll that into the larger question that we have spent so much time exploring and will continue to do throughout the next two seasons. Specifically, what is the role of Pennsylvania? inside the greater English empire. Finally, we are going to turn our attention to the frame of government itself as we examine Penn's attempt to regain control over his colony and heal some of those divisions that formed in his absence. We do have a whole lot to cover today, and I do expect this episode is going to run a bit longer than normal. So let's go ahead and jump right in. Following his being cleared of charges, the first order of business for William Penn was recapturing control over his increasingly hostile colony. The very first thing he needed to do was get the colony restored to him. By this time, there was already some movement towards converting proprietorships to royal colonies, something that we have already seen in Maryland. Penn was ultimately able to regain his charter. However, it came at the price of Penn agreeing to provide men for the common defense of the colonies. During this era with a war against France, all colonies were required to send a number of men to defend the other colonies. Failing this, they could send money in place of men. This was an issue that was going to be particularly burdensome to the pacifist Quaker population inside of Pennsylvania. However, pragmatism did demand that Penn make the agreement. As we stand right now, one would certainly imagine that Penn wanted to get out of England and get back to Pennsylvania. However, with 1695 settling in, Penn was flat broke and the colony itself was not doing much of anything to help aid that problem. Penn would spend much of the next several years in England, prior to his 1699 return to Pennsylvania, moving around the country and fighting for the rights of Quakers. However, despite him spending much of the next half decade engrossed in matters of religion, the situation back in Pennsylvania continued to be a serious problem for him. Sure, Blackwell was gone now. However, his appointment had done serious lasting damage in the colony and had made existing rifts that much wider. There was still a battle between the two groups of Quakers, the wealthy Quakers who controlled the council and the poor Quakers who controlled the much weaker assembly. This is to say nothing of the growing Anglican faction inside the colony, as well as the always ready to secede lower counties. All of this was made far more complicated by the simple fact that nobody in Pennsylvania was eagerly writing to Penn to keep him informed of what was going on. He continued to go through long droughts of information. This isn't to say that they were just flat ignoring the guy, but rather writing to him really just was not a primary concern for anybody. This was not helped by the fact that the ongoing war with France made communication between England and her colonies that much more complex. We have already discussed the damage done to the Virginia tobacco trade because of the war. Few shipments could leave the colony because of the French in the Atlantic. This same thing also caused communications to slow down significantly. In the colony itself, they were dealing with several key issues. Most specifically, they were dealing with what they were going to do to fill those militia quotas, as well as the questions regarding the taking of oaths. While the taking of oaths might seem like a rather trivial thing, 
oaths in the 17th century were a very big deal, and the Quakers not being willing to take them did not help anything. At the same time, however, the colony continued to be torn by factionalism. This hit a peak when Thomas Lloyd, the leader of the council, died in September of 1694. David Lloyd, the leader of the assembly, moved quickly and attempted to secure the great seal of the colony, which, as we discussed last time, was necessary to pass legislation. Ultimately, the council did return the seal. However, the entire council by this point was struggling as the individual members became increasingly concerned with their own business affairs. This is going to be the beginning of a trend where we will see the assembly begin to make meaningful gains in their own power. While disputes continued, none of them really laid out what an absolute mess the colony was, quite like the frame of government of 1696. The assembly, which had seen some marginal growth in its power, still yearned for the right to actually propose legislation, rather than just approving or denying the actions of the council. Following the restoration of Penn's proprietorship over Pennsylvania, England had required as a condition that he appoint a non-Quaker as the lieutenant governor. Penn, treading carefully as to not have a repeat of Blackwell, went with William Markham. Markham was an Anglican, which, while not awesome for the Quakers, he at least was not a New England Puritan. Markham, however, had a serious problem heading into 1696. Chiefly, he desperately needed to meet that militia quota, elsewise risk the wrath of London. The assembly seized on this opportunity and presented Markham with a deal. They would approve a bill granting funds to be allocated for the common defense of the colonies, something that Markham was very desperate to get done. All Markham needed to do to get his much-needed money was to sign off on a new frame of government. The resulting frame of government of 1696 would give the assembly the power to initiate legislation, a power that they had been fighting to get for the last 15 years. There were, however, several problems with the frame of 96. The first point of contention is that William Penn was left totally out of the loop. He did not find out about any of this until it was passed and accepted. Second, the entire frame of 1696 was totally and completely illegal. The original frame of government included provisions for its modification. The original frame of government, which I'm going to call the frame of 83 from here on out, required that the proprietor or their heir approve any modifications made. Remember what I said like 30 seconds ago? William Penn had zero idea that any such modification had been made, so he clearly did not agree to having any of this done. For William Markham and the council, this new frame was devastating. Suddenly, it was the assembly that held the power. Markham's own personal authority was greatly reduced under the Charter of 96. The Charter of 96 presented Pennsylvania with several pronounced problems, the first of which would come to light during the elections the following year in March of 1697. See, if a new charter had been legally passed, then it would at least have a degree of validity and authority to it. In this situation, however, the frame of government of 96 was not legally passed. They had bypassed the amendment process, and they had failed to secure the approval of William Penn himself. Therefore, that group in the colony that disagreed with the Charter of 96 had a valid argument that the thing was illegal and therefore not enforceable. This would become a real problem during the election of 1697 when the less wealthy counties voted in accordance with the Charter of 1696. More wealthy Philadelphia voted under the electoral rules of the frame of 83. Under the new system, each county was to send two people to the council and four to the assembly. Philadelphia, however, acting under the previous charter, sent three people to the council and six to the assembly. At the same time, a group of nearly 100 in Philadelphia, likely the same ones who had voted under the frame of 83, sent a petition to Markham asking him to intervene. It is interesting to note that it was not just the Philadelphia Quakers who were unhappy, but it was also the growing Anglican population who saw the frame of 96 as being nothing more than an illegitimate power grab. Both sides also now realized that at some point William Penn himself was probably going to be an important part of this entire process. After all, 
eventually the guy was bound to hear about this development. The race, therefore, became one to control the narrative surrounding the frame of 96. Penn's response here is yet another strange decision on its face. As predicted, he loudly denounced the new frame of government. What is less expected, however, is that despite denouncing it, he does little else. Penn clearly is not a fan of the new frame of government. However, at the moment, he likely begrudgingly accepted it because at least it had the colony functioning. As we are about to discuss, the debate over the colonial charter was very much in danger during this time. Missteps by Penn at this point, such as failing to provide either men or money for the common colonial defense, would have potentially catastrophic results. Like it or not, if the Charter of 1696 was going to keep things functional, so be it. That being said, however, Penn does not do anything to clear up the confusion over the matter of the frame of 83 or 96 being supreme. Penn allows the frame of 96 to function, however, he would never explicitly endorse it. Finally, in 1699, William Penn would return home to his colony. Upon his return, he found a colony that had a completely different political climate than the one that he had left all those years earlier. As we have discussed already during today's episode, throughout the second half of the 1690s, there was a decided movement away from proprietary colonial governments. With the end goal of attempting to strengthen crown control over the colonies in 1696, England established a board of trade that would oversee the colonial trade apparatus. Tasked with overseeing conditions in colonial North America is an old friend of ours, Edward Randolph, who was sent to evaluate the conditions on the ground. Randolph, somewhat unsurprisingly, if you have been following along, was not impressed by the colonial compliance with the Navigation Acts. Randolph, in a deeply unpopular move, recommended that the alleged violations of the Navigation Acts be tried in admiralty courts, rather than in courts of local jurisdiction. For the Board of Trade, there was a logic that followed along with this. The fear that the Board of Trade had, as Randolph informed them, was that the colonial prerogative and what was best for the greater empire might not always perfectly align. The judges and prosecutors located inside of the North American colonies were likely to allow illegal trade as there was an internal benefit to the colony and hence themselves. In other words, there was a high likelihood that those in charge of enforcing the Navigation Acts inside of colonial North America had incentive to not fully enforce those same acts. Interested in stamping out illegal trade, prosecution inside of an admiralty court would remove that bias. To further protect the Navigation Acts, these courts would eliminate juries as well. Juries in the North American colonies, like the judges, were likely to have an incentive not to convict for violations of the Navigation Acts. Instead, these cases would be heard by royally appointed judges. In defense of Randolph, these problems were never exactly a surprise to anybody. Francis Nicholson, for example, had himself previously complained at the difficulty of getting juries inside of Maryland to convict based on violations of the Navigation Acts. Well, you can probably guess the broad popularity of Randolph's proposals inside of the colonies. It was Pennsylvania that he directed a particular amount of wrath towards, complaining that they made no effort to follow the Navigation Acts. The Pennsylvania colony was not thrilled with these claims, and Governor Markham quickly pointed the finger at his predecessor. Penn, who was still in England at this time, was in good position to take up for the defense of the colonies. We know that during this time, William Penn was at least cooperating to a degree with Fitzjohn Winthrop, who was in Pennsylvania as an agent from Connecticut. This is not to say that there is some greater colonial coalition at the time. However, there is at least a degree of correspondence. This entire ordeal, however, made Penn believe that there needed to be some degree of mutual cooperation between the colonies in North America. Well, William Penn was not exactly suggesting a Continental Congress he did want a system in place where the colonies would at least have closer ties and could work together for the mutual benefit of the collective. What he proposed was an annual assembly that would meet during times of war to discuss colonial defense. During times of peace, the assembly would be biannual and would discuss matters of defense as well as trade between the colonies. This plan would have each colony send representatives to the assembly to discuss such matters. The plan was never adopted. 
the Board of Trade had no interest in there being a colonial assembly. The prevailing view in the 1690s was one that London was attempting to lessen colonial autonomy, a move that having a colonial assembly would have gone directly against. The battle over illegal trade is going to continue for years to come. Pennsylvania would make attempts to get around the new laws. However, the Board of Trade quickly quashed all their attempts. For Penn, this meant that upon his return to the colony, it was imperative that he prove to the Board of Trade that Pennsylvania would deal with trade violations seriously and not just blow them off. Penn seethed under the new laws and saw these admiralty cores as being excessive. After all, Penn was the proprietor. He had been given the authority to make the laws necessary for the colony. These courts were interfering and encroaching on what he viewed as his own personal powers. More than just that, however, juries were a central right of Englishmen. If you were accused of breaking a law, you had the right as an Englishman to have a jury consider your case. However, during this era, such violations were denied a trial by jury and instead were forced into an admiralty court where a judge alone held the power. Once again, we return to that question of the position of the colonists in the Greater English Empire. The colonists viewed themselves as Englishmen. They were not some conquered people. They had immigrated willingly. To think that, as an unmentioned condition of that immigration, they were forfeiting their rights as Englishmen was unfathomable. However, we have seen time and time again that in England, they did not view the American colonists as being equal to those back at home. This is, of course, nothing new and has become a major theme over the last season and a half. Penn would take great strides to attempt to show the Board of Trade that the American colonists could handle their own matters and enforce the laws of England. The use of admiralty courts is going to remain incredibly unpopular as we move through the 18th century. It is worth noting that they are not always applied with the same vigor, and over the period of time that we are going to see them used, they are going to become less popular before something will happen and they swing back into vogue. However, they are not something that will ever completely go away for the remainder of the colonial era. It is worth noting that during the 1760s, enforcements of these courts for trade violations is going to become more and more common. This is what leads Thomas Jefferson to writing in the Declaration of Independence in the indictment section that part of the reason for the rebellion was that for depriving us in many cases of a trial by jury, as well as for transporting us beyond seas to be tried for pretend offenses. So this is not a problem that is going to get cleared up anytime soon. Penn would return to the colony finally in 1699, where he would continue to fend off attacks against the colony's legal jurisdiction. By 1701, however, Penn had become aware of just how much the crown was tired of the proprietary colonial system. Penn was tipped off that a reunification bill had been presented in the House of Lords. This bill would have stripped proprietors of their holdings and converted everything into a royal colony. This was not mere puffery either. This was a serious threat to all colonial proprietors. Royal interest in such a bill makes sense. We have seen for a while now that there was interest in being done with proprietary governments as the crown sought to consolidate its colonial holdings. Proprietary governments, though easier to establish, brought with them all sorts of problems and hardships. The main issue is that often the thing that most benefits the colonial proprietor does not benefit the empire and vice versa. For the monarch, this also means that your colonies are all operating with different laws and requirements. Nobody was interested in having a redo of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. It likely also was not missed on pen that his old adversary, Lord Baltimore, had been stripped of his proprietorship, something that we had discussed back in episode 3.1. Needless to say that this was a very real risk to Penn and not something that he was going to take lying down. He quickly sought to defend the colony by pointing out that the grant of the charter had been in consideration of the large debt owed to his father. With this worrying trend continuing, however, it did make Penn realize that he was probably going to have to head back to London again, despite having only returned to Pennsylvania two years before. About the only silver lining at the moment for Penn is that he was able to save his colony, at least for the moment, 
from royal intervention. However, throughout the course of 1702, Penn had not made many friends amongst the Board of Trade. It also did not help things that New Jersey fared worse than Pennsylvania and had lost its charter in 1702. While the immediate risk to Pennsylvania was at least under control, it was not lost on Penn that the colony stood in a very precarious spot. It was under this backdrop that Penn, tired of the entire situation, made his initial attempt to sell the colony back to England. The problem is that in addition to a cash buyout, Penn wanted to guarantee the individual liberties within the colony were protected. The members of Parliament were not terribly interested in the proposal and passed on it. However, the entire affair shows just how burnt out William Penn was by this point. This is not the last time that Penn is going to attempt to sell his colony back. It is something that he's going to continue to do throughout the years. This brings up an interesting question of why did Pennsylvania never actually become a crown colony? Before we address this, however, I want to talk about that charter of 1701. But go ahead and keep this idea in the back of your mind for a few minutes as we are going to return to the subject. As we last left off, there are now two frames of government, the 1683 version and the 1696 version. The colony had been nominally operating under the 96 version. However, prior to his departure in 1701, Penn realized that the issue needed to be reconciled. William Penn understood that the colony could not continue to operate with two governing documents. The result would be known as the Charter of Privileges of 1701. There are a few things to realize about the document. First, Penn was in a huge hurry to get it done. He was leaving in 1701, and this was one of those things that he needed wrapped up before he could depart. For Penn, he had dealt with the factionalism in the colony for over a decade, and had grown very weary of it. It is possible that this is part of the reason that when the Charter of Privileges was drafted in 1701, we see the government reduced to a unicameral system. Previously, the council had acted as the upper house, and the general assembly as the lower house. However, among the changes in the Charter of Privileges is the elimination of the council. This is something of an oddity in the American colonies, as Pennsylvania would ultimately become the only colony in English North America to have a unicameral legislature. At no point in the Charter of Privileges was a council ever explicitly mentioned, which, in effect, means that the council was now dead. Under the Charter of 1701, the Assembly would have the right, finally, to officially propose legislation, and would in fact act with little in the way to check its own power. In fact, the only real check against them is that the proprietor would continue to hold a veto power over the Assembly. Other than that, the only other major check against the Assembly were the existing laws of England. Penn also attempted to solve the situation of the lower counties through the Charter of 1701. Penn wrote a provision into the Charter that allowed for the lower counties to separate their assembly from that which was meeting in Philadelphia. It took the lower counties about 30 seconds, or more seriously, about a year, to take advantage and separate their assembly from the one up in Philadelphia. From this point moving forward, the new assembly would meet in Newcastle and would be able to make their own laws. For the lower counties, this would help to mollify some of the most serious objections they had. No longer were they going to be subject to the whims of the Quakers, something that they were undoubtedly thrilled about. This is not to suggest that Delaware was now an independent colony, because it wasn't. The colony would continue to share a governor with Pennsylvania. It was simply that they would have a separate assembly. Likewise, England would never officially recognize the legitimacy of the Delaware Assembly, though it is not as though they did much to prevent it. Delaware would never actually become its own colony and would remain in the same position until the American Revolution. Additional major changes to the charter included Penn trying to establish the Pennsylvania legal system and ensure that those accused of trade violations in the colony would be tried in Pennsylvania itself. However, this provision was balked up by the Board of Trade back in London. It likewise probably is not a surprise that the Charter of 1701 was heavy on discussion over religion. The document did provide the expected freedom of conscience, provided that the person was a Christian. The Charter of 1701 is going to help in its goal of relieving much of the tension that had developed over the prior 15 years. 
the lower counties now had their own assembly and were no longer subject to the whims of the Philadelphia Quakers. The council had been relieved of its power as a legislative body, which would help reduce the factionalism between the Quakers. The new charter was, in the eyes of the assembly, an improvement upon the prior systems, and it was quickly adopted. Problems did, of course, still remain and would continue to be a source of infighting within the colony. The assembly would still clash with Penn moving forward. However, the frame of 1701 brought much-needed clarity to the political situation inside of Pennsylvania at a time when the colony desperately needed it. The charter would likewise really bolster the power of the assembly. Yes, Penn still held a veto as did the Privy Council back in London. However, the Assembly, and therefore the people, had a surprisingly large amount of power and self-determination. The Charter was so broad in the powers given to the Assembly that it encroached on the powers of the proprietor himself. This control came primarily in the way of economics. With all of its new powers, it was the Assembly that was still in charge of providing the funding. Being able to propose and pass legislation, as well as authorize funding out of a single-chambered legislature, provided the Pennsylvania Assembly with a tremendous amount of control and power. Sure, Penn had that veto power, however, with the Assembly having power over both legislation and funding, it was a veto power that the executive was going to need to use very carefully. Possibly the most surprising thing about the Charter of 1701 is the fact that, Despite its relative simplicity, it had a staying power. This is in fact the final colonial government in Pennsylvania and would survive all the way up until 1776. This brings us to one of the more perplexing questions regarding Pennsylvania. Specifically, how did the colony not transform into a crown colony? How did the proprietorship survive? The answer to this question really has nothing to do with a lack of effort on either side. England had made overtures during the late 1690s that they wanted to convert the colony into a royal colony, as the concept of having proprietors run their colonies fell increasingly out of vogue. Furthermore, William Penn himself, on multiple occasions, tried to just give the colony back to the English, though still trying to work out a situation where he would benefit from the old grant. I can also tell you that as we push forward, we are not going to see proprietary colonies return to prominence. The crown wanted control, and we are going to see continued movement towards royal control and away from the proprietary system. So then, why is Pennsylvania different? We know that there were attempts on both sides, yet it survived until 1776 under the control of the Penn family. Initially, at least, the negotiations fell flat between Penn and the Board of Trade to surrender the colony, over a differing opinion about Penn's future role. Penn wanted a large sum of money, which, considering his economic situation, was not really surprising. He, likewise, wanted to secure protections for the Quakers, and continued to hold the power for himself and his heirs to nominate royal governors in the future for the colony. This was too much for the board, and the deal was not agreed to. What follows is years of back-and-forth options being presented. An agreement was finally reached in 1712. However, shortly after it took effect, Penn fell seriously ill. The illness was so serious that it affected his mental state, which brought the newly reached agreement into question. Despite some attempts to have the parliament turn the agreement into a royal act, This never took place. When Penn dies in 1718, the colony passed into the hands of his heirs, and that pretty much ends the question of it ever becoming a royal colony voluntarily. In general terms, it proved to be a surprisingly difficult thing for Parliament to step in and simply invalidate all of the proprietorships. The problem being that most of the proprietors were themselves powerful figures back in England and were well situated to protect their own rights. There were some broad sweeping attempts back in London to end all colonial proprietorships. However, these never really get anywhere. Rather, the death of colonial proprietorships would come one at a time. We see this, for example, in the Carolinas, where the proprietors would ultimately end up selling their shares back to the crown. 
there will never be a greater sweeping movement that tosses everybody to the curb in a single swoop. Upon Penn's death, his heir, William Penn Jr., showed far less interest in parting with his new colonial holdings, which brought a quick end to the idea that a deal could be reached with Penn to convert it into a royal colony. The ability to avoid conversion to a crown colony was also aided by the fact that the Whigs were particularly powerful during the middle of the 18th century. They were far less anxious to see the colonies converted into royal colonies than their rival Tories. It is interesting to note that Penn, having reached an agreement to divest himself from the colony, would have long-lasting ramifications. For one, as the colony saw an increasing Anglican population, there was more interest internally from that group to become a royal colony. It is also worth a mention that the last champion of divesting the colony from the Penn family and converting it into a royal colony was none other than Benjamin Franklin. It was Franklin in 1756, and again in 1764, that came the closest to actually getting the government of England to act and revoke the Pennsylvania Charter. We will touch some more on this in the future, as the battle against Pennsylvania also meant that Franklin was in England during some of the more dramatic moments of colonial history. It was indeed events surrounding the American colonists' response to the Stamp Act that would help save Pennsylvania's proprietors in 1765. The vitriolic response to the Stamp Act helped move the focus from the domestic strife and one to the larger question about the overall relationship between Parliament and the colonies. The proprietors used this opportunity to ally themselves with Parliament on the issue and hence deflect attention away from themselves. There were a few more minor salvos in the form of an attempted buyout by Parliament in 1766. However, by that point, the Pens had no interest in selling and the matter was dropped. When we reach 1766, we are well in the run-up to the revolution. Well, the concept of a break with Britain was still unlikely by the middle part of the 1760s, there was an undeniable tension that existed between the mother country and her colonies. This is going to ramp up another notch in the 1770s and would accumulate an all-out war, beginning in 1775. Following 1766, there were no further attempts by either side to convert Pennsylvania into a royal colony. At various times, both sides appear to have interest in reaching an agreement that would have made Pennsylvania into a royal colony. However, the stars would simply never align, other than briefly in 1712, to make such a transition possible. Following 1766, it is more as though time ran out on the project as attention shifted to other colonial concerns, rather than there being some kind of a definitive victory for either side. Pennsylvania will remain a proprietary colony all the way to the revolution. Before we wrap up for today, I want to give a couple of final notes on William Penn. William Penn would never return to Pennsylvania following his departure in 1701. As Penn would struggle with the question of what exactly to do with his colony, be it give it back or somehow sell it back, he would continue to deal with crippling financial problems. Now, these are the same problems that we have seen him have really throughout our entire story. However, by the time we are moving through the early 1700s, these problems are compounding for William Penn and are becoming a far bigger concern for our proprietor. This desperation to make money is the reason why we see Penn's sudden interest in divesting himself from the colony in exchange for cash. Pennsylvania had never become profitable for him, and as we have discussed, he continually struggled to get any money sent to him from the colony. Things were made worse as the person who had been acting as Penn's financial advisor had, in reality, set up a system whereby William Penn had become deeply in debt to him. All of this would accumulate with a then 62-year-old William Penn finding himself in debtor's prison. Penn would not remain there for long, however, having his sentence reduced to house arrest. In 1712, Penn suffered a stroke which caused him to believe that his own death was near. While he would recover from the first stroke, he was hit later in 1712 with a second, far more catastrophic stroke. We had talked a few minutes ago that a deal was struck between Penn and the Board of Trade regarding Pennsylvania that needed to be abandoned because of Penn's health. It is the second stroke that broke up that agreement. 
Penn would spend the next six years of his life in a steep mental and physical decline. Penn's wife, Hannah Callowhill, would write in 1714 that Penn could barely comprehend information being given to him about Pennsylvania. Evidence suggests that during the final six years of his life, Penn had only periods of lucid thought and was often described as sitting there with a vacant smile. On July 30th, 1718, William Penn died. What is the legacy of William Penn? Initially, I had wanted to write a biography episode on Penn. However, after I started working on it, I realized that there is so much to discuss and that his life was so closely tied with Pennsylvania that the task became impossible. Penn is something of a sympathetic figure. It is hard to argue that he came with the best possible intentions. He fought for the rights of the Quakers and the original draft of the frame of government had been an amazingly liberal document for the time. The problem for Penn is that the political realities would often clash with his more idealistic views. Penn was an opportunist. We see this in his relationship with James II. Penn was not a Catholic and likely was not a wild fan of them. However, he was pragmatic in his approach and understood that religious toleration for Catholics could prove to be beneficial for his Quakers. Penn, throughout his entire life, fought for the rights of the Quakers and did a great deal to ensure their protection. Penn did, however, make some stunningly strange decisions, such as his appointment of John Blackwell, a New England Puritan, as the lieutenant governor. Despite trying, I could not find a single satisfactory answer to what Penn was thinking here. I saw plenty of guesses, some better than others. However, there seemed to be something of a collective head shaking. It was simply such an odd move that it made little sense. Likewise, it is hard not to feel as though Penn at times spread himself too thinly. Penn spent little time actually in Pennsylvania during his life. He was often caught back in England, dealing with fire after fire. Well, his personal finances certainly did not help him out. It cannot be missed that Penn spent much of his time working on other projects. He continued to advocate for the rights of the Quakers. He grew increasingly important on the court of James II. All the meanwhile, Pennsylvania struggled under increasing factionalism. You can, of course, argue that Penn's actions in England were being done to the benefit of Pennsylvania. However, that does not make him any less of an absentee proprietor, a position that he likely never intended to have. At the end of the day, it is impossible not to see Penn as an absolute giant of his era. His fingerprints are all over Pennsylvania and, by extension, Delaware. He was a major player in the Glorious Revolution, especially when it came to the religious matters, which were so central to the coming events. He did a great deal to bring the Quakers into the light and fought tirelessly against their persecution, often at great risk and cost to himself. While he would certainly make missteps along the way, it is impossible to deny William Penn's impact as it relates to the Quakers, to events back in England itself during the Glorious Revolution, and, of course, to the Pennsylvania colony. With that, I'm ready to set not just Pennsylvania aside for the moment, but it is also about time that we set the 1600s aside as well. Next time, we are going to spend our time conducting something of a census of the colonies at the dawn of the 18th century. I want to look at where the colonies stand, who is settling them, and the general trends that we are going to see begin to form that will help define the next half century. With that, I hope you all have a wonderful two weeks, that you are staying healthy, and that you are staying safe. And I will see you back here next time, where we will discuss where the colonies stand, heading into a new century. <laughs>